chat, we listen, we love. Hey everyone, welcome to Bible Q&A. No background tonight because there's something funny going on around here and I don't know what it means. Except that, you know, we're still here. So yay, nothing burned down. But this is Bible Q&A. Ignore that. <laughs> Question that comes at me today is a bit of a doozy. Um, <clears throat> can you explain 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 1 through 16? So I'm like, hmm, didn't ring a bell at first. Go and look. Rules for worship. And this is the part of 1 Corinthians that talks about um, how, uh, how women are supposed to conduct themselves in church. Oh boy. <laughs> That's my first thought. My second thought is, okay, let's take an honest crack at it. I think the first thing we need to do is we need to get our bearings. And what I mean by that is, is that a lot of the time, um, we forget context. And that's really important in these letters that Paul is writing. And they are. They're letters to people. Paul is saying these things to a specific group of people in response to things that they've asked him or wrote to him about in letters that we don't actually have. <laughs> you know, Paul got letters from the Corinthian church, the church in Corinth, whatever you want to call it, and he wrote responses. 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians is those are those responses. And we don't have those. We don't have their side of it. We just have Paul's side and what Paul's saying. Why do we have that in the Bible then? Because it's still important. And it still is, it tells us a lot about what the church was going through and what they were dealing with in, uh, in these situations. So because of that, I want to start off in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. A little bit and I just want to read the beginning here from Paul chosen by God to be an apostle of Jesus Christ and from Sosthenes who is also a follower most likely this is the person who delivered the letter oh I don't know that for sure to God's church in Corinth Christ Jesus chose you to be his very own people and you worship in his name as we and all others do who call him Lord my prayer is that God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ will be kind to you and will bless you with peace. I never stop thanking my God for being kind enough to give you Christ Jesus, who helps you to speak and understand so well. Now you are certain that everything we told you about our Lord Jesus Christ is true. You are not missing out on any blessings as you wait for him to return. And until the day Christ does return, he will keep you completely innocent. God can be trusted and he chose you to be partners with his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. So we see this right here Paul is Paul is identifying himself but then he also identifies who the letter is to to God's church in Corinth Christ Jesus chose you to be his very own people you worship in his name as we and all others do who call him Lord this is a letter to the church in Corinth so that stated let's get into 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and keep that in mind because it actually is important this person who asked the question wants me to talk about verses one, verses 1 through 16 in chapter 11, and it's actually a lot. So this is going to be a bit of a long video because I'm going to read it. <laughs> Feel free to follow along. I feel like it's basically a sermon at this point, my goodness. And verse 1 is really part of something before, so we're going to start with verse 2. <clears throat> Rules for worship. Paul starts out, I am proud of you because you always remember me and obey the teachings I gave you. Now I want you to know that Christ is the head over all men and a man is the head over a woman, but God is the head over Christ. This means that any man who prays or prophesies with something on his head brings shame to his head, but any woman who prays or prophesies without something on her head brings shame to her head. In fact, she may as well shave her head. A woman should wear something on her head. It is a disgrace for a woman to shave her head or cut her hair, but if she refuses to wear something on her head, let her hair be cut off. So, what's that? <laughs> What is it for real? Like, let's process this. What's going on here? Because you can flip back in the Gospels and you can flip through all of it and Jesus doesn't say anything about what goes on your head and what doesn't. It don't say that. So what is this? Hmm. 
We could go all the way back into the Old Testament, but at the same time, that can get a bit dodgy because there's a lot of stuff in the Old Testament. And it does get a bit dodgy. So what's going on here? Hmm. <laughs> Let's keep reading. See if we can figure it out by going further. Men were created to be like God and to bring honor to God. This means that a man should not wear anything on his head. Women were created to bring honor to men. It was the woman who was made from a man and not the man who was made from a woman. He wasn't created for her. She was created for him. And so because of this and also because of the angels, a woman ought to wear something on her head as a sign of her authority. Interesting. As far as the Lord is concerned... Men and women need each other. It is true that the first woman came from a man, but all the other men have been given birth by women. Oh. Yet God is the one who creates everything. Ask yourself if it is proper for a woman to pray without something on her head. Isn't it unnatural and disgraceful for men to have long hair? But long hair is a beautiful way for a woman to cover her head. This is how things are done in all of God's churches, and that's why none of you should argue about what I have said. Hmm. So it would appear that the church was at an impasse regarding, um, what does it sound like? <laughs> Not a spiritual problem. This sounds like a dress code. This is a dress code thing. Obviously, the church in Corinth is having dress code issues. How exactly are we supposed to be dressed? How exactly are we supposed to behave? And it's interesting where, uh, where Paul takes the argument. You know, if you look here, verse 11 through verse 16, that's where the meat of this is, okay? Because Paul explains everything that he's just said right there. You know, ask yourself if it is proper for a woman to pray without something on her head. Is it proper... Is it proper? Notice Paul's language there. He's not saying, does Jesus say? Does the Bible say? What does the Old Testament say? See, that's the interesting part. Paul is not afraid to bring in the scriptures and bring down some divine rebuking, okay? Not afraid. He's got no problem with that. He does it all the time. Go read Romans. But this isn't about that, is it? Instead, he asks, is it proper? Not, is it holy? Not, what did so-and-so say about this in this book? Is it proper? Well, what defines proper? I mean, is it proper to wear a baseball cap at the dinner table? Is it proper to wear a t-shirt to prom? Is it proper to... Um, to text someone startlingly amazing news now that's changing as far as texting and calling it used to be that if something amazing happened you called people you know now when people get like pregnant they ain't calling people they're posting funny pictures on facebook like we're pregnant oh no everybody <laughs> what we're talking about here is we're talking about proper behavior what informs proper behavior? Yes, the Bible informs proper behavior, but so does our culture. So does the world around us. It informs proper behavior. We're talking about society. We're talking about what's acceptable culturally here. So when Paul asks, is it proper? What Paul is asking them is he's saying, well, do you think this is okay? You know, like, what what, what, what what, other people have to say about this? Hmm. Paul's appealing to a cultural standard here. And it's true. In that culture, there were certain expectations of men and women, just like there are today, certain cultural expectations. And it's funny because in our culture, you know, for the most part, men are allowed to have long hair. It's cool. No problem, you know. I mean, it's kind of looked down upon still, but it's not necessarily something that's going to get you discriminated against. I mean, in, a, in, in some areas. For instance, if you're in a band, long hair, no problem. But if you're trying to be the CEO of like some company, it's going to be an issue, most likely. And why is that? Why is it that, you know, the lead singer of a heavy metal Christian band can have hair? Okay, you remember that guy from POD, those dreads, man? Huge. They were like down to his hiney. So why can't the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase have hair like that? Because of culture. The culture 
in the Christian rock and heavy metal sphere is very accepting of long hair. But the business culture involved in J.P. Morgan Chase, a corporate Wall Street company, is very, you know, very, keep it short. <laughs> it's all about business with them, you know? Functionality. We're talking about culture here. So it's interesting because what Paul is saying here, if we acknowledge that this is about culture, <laughs> What we find is Paul is actually saying, behave yourselves according to the way that you were raised. Okay? Like, I kind of get a sense as I read this that Paul's not necessarily invoking, you know, scripture. He's just kind of saying, were you born in a barn? Is this the way you really behave? This goes against what you have been taught and raised up to act like. What was going on in the Corinthian church a lot of the time and you'll find this if you read through, especially uh, right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. You know, um, he talks about an, Im an immoral follower who, uh, who's in a sexual relationship with his stepmother. Whoa, what? Exactly. One of the problems in 1 Corinthians that Paul is addressing, an overall problem, is that the Corinthians are kind of under this impression that um, that grace in Jesus Christ means that they get to uh, they kind of get to do their own society now. The rules have changed. They're allowed to do new and different things. It's okay for them to be countercultural, in other words, and they are encouraging each other to do so. You know, just like in 1 Corinthians five says, a man is even sleeping with his own stepmother and you are proud when you ought to feel bad enough to chase away anyone who acts like that. I'm trying to find the part in here. Oh, I can't find it. I was pretty sure that there's also a part in here. Yeah, right here. In fact, you are behaving worse than the Gentiles in that regard. <laughs> Isn't that great? See, Paul appealing to the culture again in 1 Corinthians. He's saying, you guys are totally cool with this. Be somebody who's engaged in this awful behavior that not even the non-believers around you are willing to tolerate. And you're proud. Why? Because he's with you and you're like, yes. So Paul, once again, using the culture around the Corinthians to kind of shake them a little bit. What Paul is saying kind of goes to this old Christian mantra we hear sometimes, in the world but not of it. Culture, no matter what, is always going to dictate to some extent how we worship and how we conduct ourselves. And frankly, if, Christian, if Christianity is going to... Um, you know, spread, then, no, that's the wrong way of saying it. Let me rephrase that. Christianity should be bringing out the best in people. It really should. It should just be bringing out the best in people. And that's not a blanket rule. It's not a doctrine. Please don't apply it that way. What I'm saying is, is that one of the byproducts of the Christian faith is that people clean up their acts, so to speak. And while not shunning sinful people, conducting themselves in such a way that it's very obvious that their life has been changed. So Paul's kind of going after them here and he's saying, don't take this to an extreme. Don't say, well, now that I'm a Christian, I have to just, you know, throw off all this stuff. Throw off this society and the way that I was raised. It's all messed up and silly, you know? So, obviously, at some point, you had uh, men and women who were saying, Hey, you can't, you can't tell me to cut my hair. You can't tell me to put something on my head. I'm covered by the grace of Jesus Christ, and I will do as I please. And for you to judge me, mm -mm -mm, I don't like it. I don't like it. And you know what? I don't, I don't have to put up with judgment because I'm under the grace of Jesus. You see? And doesn't that sound familiar? We encounter the same thing today. And what's funny about it is, is that there's a little grain of self-righteousness in it. And it kind of comes from this idea that we are good as we are. 
good as we are and that and that being a christian doesn't involve getting better it doesn't involve going on a journey of self-discovery of self-discipline and training and and becoming something greater than we are it comes from this idea that christianity is sort of like an as is thing that jesus loves us just the way we are <laughs> and he does but he wants better for us he always wants better for us and he always wants a striving to move forward and part of the way that we do that is acknowledging the fact that our societies and our cultures expect us to behave a certain way and if we want to have good reputations we have to behave in those ways and there are all sorts of cultures in our world today even here in the united states of america societies and cultures and subcultures and we're expected in those little pockets, those little groups, to behave in certain ways, to say certain things. And frankly, if they don't go against something that's in the Bible, then they're permissible. You know, permissible. Does having the long metal hair somehow invalidate, you know, the faith of, uh, of guys in Christian hard rock bands who have them? When they stand there and they preach sermons that are greater than some of the sermons that you've heard in church, admit it. <laughs> then at the same time, you know, just wearing a suit to work every day and having very short, tight haircut on top, does that somehow invalidate you? Does your love of baseball caps somehow invalidate your faith? You see what I'm saying here? We try to make rules and then it's all... <laughs> But at the end of the day, all Paul is saying here, or trying to say is, is that the church in Corinth has got to conduct themselves under some rules. There have to be rules. There have to be guidelines. And it's easier to just follow the basic guidelines that society accepts within, within the bounds of a Christ-like biblical life. So in other words, if society decides at some point later on in the future that it's okay for people to walk around in, you know, bikinis and thongs or speedos, you know, or it's okay for guys to walk around with no shirts on and that becomes a new thing, no shirts. Well, I think that's a problem. And I think that that goes well beyond good taste, which is exactly why Paul says here talking about a theology behind it, you know, talking about how there's a biblical perspective, saying stuff like, you know, as far as the Lord is concerned, men and women need each other. Da, 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 you know, he's addressing this idea that they're fighting with each other and they're squabbling. <laughs> but he throws some theology at them in verses seven through ten to show them that just because it's it's a societal rule, that it's a cultural norm, doesn't necessarily mean that it isn't relevant to God's plan. It doesn't mean that God doesn't have something to say about it. This has been a very long Bible Q&A. We're at 20 minutes now, goodness. It's been a long one, but I wanted to make sure that I explained very clearly where we were going. So the question was, can you explain this? The answer, in short, concluding, Paul is addressing a behavior problem regarding dress code in the church of Corinth. And his solution for it is to tell the people of Corinth that they have been raised in a culture that has redeeming qualities. And that part of this culture's redeeming qualities is the way that men and women are to conduct themselves and dress. And then Paul says, do that and stop causing trouble and don't bring yourself into disrepute and, and cause people around you to be like, those Christians are crazy. Have you seen the way they dress? Have you seen the way they behave and the kinds of people that they hang out with? And, you know, to a degree, we're called to uh, a bit of counterculturalism. But Paul is emphasizing here not to the point that they're taking it where it's causing division and friction and infighting in the church because that is not glorifying Christ. So, yeah, as I said before, within the bounds of a Christ-like life and the foundational principles of the Bible. <laughs> that's a mouthful. Anyway, that's it. I've talked enough. I'm out. Um, if you have any questions about this, post them in the chat room. 
if you're watching online, afterwards, recording, hi, future, email me at clint at remedylive.com and we can talk more about it. Let's keep rolling because we got music to play and I've talked so much. I'll play you four songs instead of three just so we're even. Owl City, coming at you now right here on Remedy Live. 